Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first in our series of uh, webinars and presentations today uh, for the contracting community. My name is Rhys Thomas. I'm the Managing Director of WTT, and I'm joined this morning with Tom Wallace, Director of Tax Investigations, and Mark Islin, Director of Islin Wealth Management. Um, who are, and Mark is going to take us through the kind of um, key points of investing for contractors. I'm going to hand over to Mark pretty quickly. Um, he's going to run through the presentation, and Tom will kind of bring in some conversational points. But a few housekeeping points in the panel of your webinar, you'll see there's a box for questions. Feel free to ask any questions throughout the session as we go as you see fit, and Mark will um, approach as many of those questions at the end of the session as possible. Um, we'll try and steer clear too much of individual questions, but the more general questions would be great. Um, if needed, obviously, you can follow up with Mark, whose details are available at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark to introduce himself and go through the, the presentation. Thanks, Reese. Morning. Can everybody, can everybody hear me? Okay, just to double check. Yeah, yeah, we can. Mark. Perfect. Well, very good morning to everybody, and, and um, thank you very much for taking time out of your days to be here today. Um, as Reese said, my name is Mark Islin, and I'm the director of Islin Wealth Management. And the the main topic for today's conversation is going to be financial planning. How organised are you? Now, in terms of how we plan on uh, structuring this this morning, um, the aim is to do a 45 minute somewhat of a conversational piece. It'll be predominantly myself speaking uh, with Tom and Reese chipping in as and where they see fit. Um, and then we plan on doing a 15 minute Q&A at the back end. So if you, if you do have questions, um, feel free to pop them in the chat facility as we're going. Um, hopefully Tom or Reese will be monitoring it as we're moving through. I, I think I can keep an eye on things as well, but hopefully one of the guys will just be able to fire something at me um, as and when appropriate to do so. Um, let me just check that I've got control of the screen here. Perfect, I do. So, in terms of um, the agenda, what we plan on covering off um, with you all this morning, um, I will give a brief introduction to myself and uh, the principles of financial planning. So, some of the things that we think about um, when we're starting to put together a financial plan for clients. Then we'll move on to look at employed versus self-employed, some of the potential benefits, and benefits can be interpreted in, in, in either way, but when, when you're thinking about employed versus self-employed. Then we'll look at financial protection, start to think about why it's so important for you, especially as a contractor, to ensure you are adequately protected. Then move on to pensions and why they're tax efficient for a limited company. Retirement planning is more than pensions alone. And that's this is something that I discuss with clients regularly where people get fixated on pensions, pensions, pensions. And of course, pensions are incredibly important, but there is more to retirement planning than pensions. And then lastly, at the back end, a very high level, um, and I say at a high level, um, for, for, because of regulatory reasons, and I will explain more about that as when we get there, but we, when, then we'll touch on tax advantaged investments and alternative investments. So to introduce myself to you all, my name is Mark Islin. Um, as I said, I am the Director of Islin Wealth Management. Um, as a business, we are uh, a part of the practice of St. James's Place Wealth Management. And my ultimate objective when I'm working with clients is to help them to make money and save tax over the medium to long term by understanding what their financial objectives are, understanding what they do and don't have, financially speaking, that is. And then I help to put the right financial plans into place in order to help them achieve those financial objectives as tax efficiently as possible over the medium to long term. And the reason why I stress tax efficiently when I said that just now is because you can have the best performing portfolio giving outrageously good returns. But if it isn't structured correctly from a tax efficiency perspective, you're going to end up paying considerably more tax on those gains than what you may necessarily have had to had it been structured in the right way at outset. And if you're paying tax on gains, then that's effectively bringing down the net performance that you're effectively taking. So it really is important, as I say, to make sure things are structured correctly from a tax efficiency perspective. Um, so, Mark, how important is that upfront to kind of have that in mind when you start the, the planning phase? Oh, it's really important. Yeah, it's, it's really, really is important. I mean, the, the next slide I was, I'll, I'll come on to in a moment, Tom, it, it shows a, um, a, a pyramid of how we sort of work through things. And it's there's, there's building blocks. I'll come on to it in a moment. If that's right, Tom. But it is really, really important. Real. 
Okay, fantastic. So my my um my areas of expertise sit within investment planning, um, pensions and retirement planning, uh, financial protection to make sure that you and your family is adequately protected, and tax mitigation strategies. So ways that we look to reduce income tax, capital gains tax, corporation tax, inheritance tax. Um, and within inheritance tax, we also do a fair amount of trust and estate planning as well. So your point there, Tom, that you just asked, goals-based advice. It's really important, as I say, that we want to focus on what the client's financial objectives are. That's the most important thing, helping people to make money and save tax over the medium to long term based on their financial objectives. So, you know, too many people get fixated on when they're thinking about investing, that top piece of that pyramid, the investment selection, what we're investing in. And of course, look, let's, let's not be silly about this. It's incredibly important to have the right investment selection because ultimately that's what's going to generate you new growth over the medium to long term. But there's a process in place. And first things first, the foundation to any good financial plan is to have a goal and to make sure I understand what it is that you want to achieve over the long term. And having a goal, having a financial objective, deciding what's important to you can take on many forms. You know, a, an objective can be I want to have X amount per year once I, hit, once I hit retirement. An objective can be I want my child to have X amount once they are ready to buy a property. It could be I want to protect my family. It could be I want to reduce income tax. There's so many different objectives, but nonetheless, from my side, as a wealth manager, as a financial planner, it's imperative that that's the first thing that we actually really, really establish. And then we start to think about how you can achieve those. Tom, you're going to jump in there? Yeah, I was, Mark, I was going to ask just a quick, quick question because you, you've yeah. used the term medium to, to long term here. Now, yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. My, myself and Reese have met plenty of contractors in our time that perhaps started out <laughs> A six-month contract now probably have been contracting five, maybe even ten years, um, yeah. and haven't really thought about any of this this stuff that that is quite important um, clearly for for the future. Yeah. What is medium to long term, and 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 how quickly do you have to start that process in your career? Yeah, in, no, it's a really interesting question. So, me, medium to long term, from my perspective. Is, is a minimum of five years plus. So whenever anyone's making any investment, you're thinking about, I'm investing for a minimum time horizon of five years. Um, that would be the minimum end of medium term. And that's, that's just purely from a, an investment perspective. You need to have a, a sensible period of time to weather any short-term volatility that may occur in markets. So that would, that's always my minimum. Realistically, medium to long-term, you are talking 10, 15, and, and you know, long-term, Long term has a different interpretation to different people. Long term for one person might be, you know, long term is planning to buy um, you know, a property for my child. Uh, long term could mean retirement. Long term could mean inheritance when I'm no longer here. So, so long term is open ended in that sense of the word. But from my perspective, it's a minimum of sort of five, five years plus. So to answer your question of how quickly, uh, you know, contractors should be starting to think about these, this type of planning time, it's as soon as they're in a, in a position that they realistically can do so. Um, you know, you, you don't have to necessarily start putting every single thing into savings, investment, protection, but you start by just putting the foundations in place, making sure you're adequately protected, and then you just layer it up bit by bit by bit as time goes on. Yeah, no, that's, that, 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 I think that's quite interesting to, to kind of get that, that, that perspective on the timelines here. Thanks, Mark. No, great pleasure. Sorry, can you hear my email pinging off, by the way, the whole time? Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Sorry, hang on, I'm just closing my emails down now. They keep, <laughs> I've got loads of reminders coming up. Sorry, I've closed that off, but hopefully you won't get that anymore. Um, <laughs> um, so once once we've got that goal in mind, then we're thinking about how much we're going to put into it. Um, disposable income, savings, investments, their cash getting, you know, zero growth, losing value in real terms relative to inflation. Then we're thinking about behaviour and asset allocation. Now, I'm not going to sort of labour on this point, but this is sort of me more than anything, understanding where I think you are on a risk spectrum. And to be honest, a lot of the time, it's not what clients do say to me, it's what they don't say to me. That, that's what enables me to understand how much risk they should or shouldn't be taking within, in, within an investment portfolio. And then as we get towards the top, then we start to think about how tax efficient are we going to be? How are we going to structure this? You know, what tax wrapper to use you know, wealth management language are we going to use? So we're going to use pensions, ISAs, onshore bonds, offshore bonds, etc. And then once we know that, then we can decide what we're going to physically be investing in. And the investment selection piece is really, really important because at the end of the day, as I said before, that's what's going to generate your returns. And this, this slide here 
is a really interesting slide because what it actually does is it shows you calendar year um, asset class returns and it shows that different asset classes have produced different returns over different years. So effectively it's showing you why diversification is so important when we're putting together an investment portfolio for a client. And diversification and the advice that we provide around diversification comes in different, in, in different ways. You diversify a portfolio through asset class. So an asset class is equities or stocks and shares. Uh, bonds, you know, commercial um, government bonds, co um, corporate bonds, uh, cash within a portfolio, commercial property, alternatives, etc. We want to layer it up. We then think about regions. So what's the regional split within a portfolio going to look like? North American exposure, Asia Pacific exposure, UK, Europe. Fund managers want different fund managers having different investment styles. So effectively, that's where, that's the final piece of the puzzle. We're saying we want to give you sustainable and maintainable levels of returns over the medium to long term. We now clarified what we mean by medium to long term, um, but we want to do it in a way which is going to be correct for you from a risk perspective. And when I say so, the, is this slide oh, showing then, Mark, is, is this slide showing us that clearly the, the more diversity you have in your portfolio, the more you're going to be able to ride out the the the, the, the lows and highs of the market. Bingo, exactly right. Exactly right. That's, that's exactly what it's showing you. So you can see a prime example. Um, if you go from uh, 2010, emerging markets equity in 2010, best performing asset class in that year, the following year, the bottom, the following year, 2012, towards the top of the pack again. So it's exactly right. If you've got a diversified portfolio, there's going to be some years where certain asset classes, certain sectors, certain regions do well, and some years where others do badly. But if you are properly spread from an investment perspective, then it's going to balance itself out and hopefully give you that sensible level of growth as time goes on. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting slide that it, it, it's 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 interesting to just look. I mean, there's almost no two types of, of asset that performs the same year on year. No, it's very rare. You're, you're right. It's, you, you're completely right. It's very rare. I mean, US equities has done particularly well over the past few years, but you know, aside from that, you, you're completely right. The asset classes tend to sort of move all over the place. Equities um, will, and they have been over the last 100 years, the best performing asset class without a shadow of a doubt. So equities, just to break this down further, sorry, from a simplicity perspective, equities are stocks and shares, for those who don't know. Um, so we always need equities in a portfolio. However, if you've got 100% equity exposure in a portfolio, you are taking on some serious risk. So what we decide when we're designing a portfolio is the correct level of risk for you as an individual and that normally um, means how much equity exposure we're giving you because we want growth but the growth that we're giving has to be relative it has to be correct for you as an individual you know the amount of times tom that i hear somebody say to me oh i'm a high risk investor yeah yeah, yeah. put me high risk and then i scratch mm -hmm. beneath the surface and you realize this person really isn't high risk they've got zero investment experience They've never, they've never felt what it's like to lose money. They think they know what it's like to hit money. They think they've got a plan in place. And to use the old Mike Tyson adage, and it's been so true throughout the early part of 2020 with everything that we've seen through, through COVID-19, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the truth of it. Everyone thinks they understand volatility until they experience volatility. And that's why it's my job to rein people in say to them no this is what's sensible for you to take from a risk perspective this is how we should design your investment portfolio yeah i think that makes i mean that makes absolute sense i i think like you say many people think they're high risk it's why it's important some like you explained really what high risk means um, um some of these some of these numbers on here you know in the badges are, are scary so it's obviously quite important to to get that mixed portfolio um from a layman's point of view, of course. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right, Tom. Um, next slide I thought was particularly interesting. I don't want to talk into a huge amount of detail of everything that's going on year to date. But you know, when I when I just sort of I spoke about volatility just now, then the next slide is a really interesting one to show the importance of advice. And one of my primary jobs is to remove emotion from investment decisions. So this slide here looks at the FTSE All Share Index. And it's discreetly yearly returns. So just just for anyone who isn't aware of the FTSE All Share Index, to give you the exact definition, this isn't me being clever. This is the exact definition of the uh, of FTSE website. FTSE All Share Index represents 98 to 99% of UK market capitalisation, 
the FTSE All Share Index is the aggregation of the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250, which is the FTSE 350, and the FTSE Small Cap Index. Okay, so this is a pretty good representation of UK PLC, so to speak. Now, what we're looking at on this slide, the solid bars are showing us how the FTSE All Share closed in any given year. So, prime example, if we were to go here, in 1987, it closed up 8% for the year. If you were to go along to 1990, it closed down 10%, etc. The little dot that you're seeing further down, that is the intra-year decline. In other words, that is the lowest point that the FTSE All Share got in any given year. So in 1987, at some point during that year, the FTSE All Share was down 35%, but it closed up 8%. Now, interestingly, if you look across the 1986 to 2019, there's not a single year, not a single year, where the intra-year low was the closing point for that year. We have bounced off the low in every single negative year between 1986 to 2019. And that's really, really important because investors, retail investors, i.e. non-professional, so you know, when I say non-professional, I've got professional clients I work with, be traders in the city, they might work within hedge funds, but the minute they're investing from me, they're retail investors same as everybody is. And the minute you're looking after your, you know, your own wealth is involved in something, people's investment decisions are very different because they get emotional about things. And especially when you see money going down in value, you see markets dropping, as they did the early part of this year, you can make bad decisions. And that's why it's so important for me to just sit with clients and say to them, look, we need to think about this logically, pragmatically. Your long-term objectives hasn't changed. If nothing's changed, why should your portfolio change? We leave things as they are, we write it out, and then we just wait for the bounce, wait for the markets to turn, because historically that's what they've always done, and that's exactly what they will do on this occasion. And we can see that going across on every year in the FTSE All Share. Um, you know, for example, 2008, which is probably one of the most painful uh, negative years in recent memory, it was down 40% in that year, finished up 30 the following year. Investors were probably head in hand thinking, oh my God, what's going on? Down 21% in a given time, and we closed up, <laughs> closed up 30% in that year. So it's you know, as I say, it, it's important to, th to put things into perspective. Um, and one of my biggest pieces of advice I could give anybody when investing is the news you listen to makes a big difference. So I, I will, for example, look at mainstream media on a daily basis, and then I read Bloomberg, the financial news, and how things get reported, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost laughable. You might read something, and this is just me making up numbers and making up headline, by the way, so don't, don't hold me to any of this. But Sky News, as an example, might, for example, say in the morning, um, stock markets plunge 10%, investors lose 100 billion pounds, end of the world. Then you'll flick over onto Bloomberg and say, markets off by 4%, rally due, boom, 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 boom. And it will explain it in a very, very different way. So as an investor, just be careful about what you read and just, um, you know, journalists tend to, um, they tend to print anything when it's sensationalized and when it's bad news. Very rarely will they actually tell you how well markets have done in order to cover a loss, a losses. So for example, year to date, and I can't obviously have this on the chart for obvious reasons, the FTSE All Share Index at the low was down about 35% and now we're down about 15%. Has, has it anywhere in mainstream media, has it come out and said that markets are bounced by 20% year to date? No, of course it hasn't. But you know, it was, it was there on the headlines on a daily basis when they were doing <laughs> they're doing badly but anyway let's not languish on that let's move on to more this is this is back to emotion though isn't it mark this is this is back to not being reactive and taking a long-term view yeah yeah exactly and, it, and it's and the concept I, I adhere to when i'm working with clients is it's time in the market not timing the market so if you're in the market for a long period of time and you've got that long-term financial objective then you will ride out the volatility you will ride out the volatility and you know considering how badly markets were um at some point at the early point of this year and you know markets fell off a cliff realistically between feb 20th and march 23rd you know this happened within about four week period it was unbelievable how quickly they fell um but the balance has been substantial and the majority of my clients this i've got some in positive territory for you the majority are still in uh, are still in uh, negative territory but it's it's minimal you know i was speaking to a client yesterday it's down two percent on the year and considering where we were it's, it's it's nothing so you're right it's about a lot of it is emotion uh, or decisions driven by emotion and my, my job is to remove that emotion yeah so 
employed versus self-employed, potential benefits. Um, what I'd like people to do as I'm going through this, if I may, I'm just going to flick onto the next slide very briefly. I want you to think about a few things from your own personal perspective. So number one, as we're going through these things, if you can think, how would your family cope without you? How would your family cope without your income? Second bullet point, how would you cope without your income? So you're, you're unable to work, how are you going to cope without your income? And finally, how quickly do you need to return to work? So if you're ill, you can't work, but you need to get back to work. How important is it for you to get back to work quickly? So just think about those points as we're going through this. So all of these potential benefits, and there's loads of potential benefits. I'm only focusing on three things here, or three protection benefits and a pension benefit. But all of these are potentially given to you, or could be given to you, employed. Self-employed is a contractor for a limited company. No, it's down to you to put these in place for yourself. So death in service, well, what is death in service? It's a lump sum that gets paid out on your debt. Your family can then use it to pay down mortgage or whatever it may be. If you're an employed role, that can be given to you. If you're self-employed and you're running a limited company, then it's down to you to sort that out for yourself. So you could easily have a personal protection policy and you pay it out of your net income. So you have life cover, you have mortgage protection. That's fine, that's fine. But let's think about this as a contractor. You get paid into your limited company. You pay corporation tax on, them, on, on, on those profits, working on the assumption you're taking dividends, that is. You then distribute money out, you pay dividend tax. You've now got net income, you pay the premiums. Alternatively, you can consider relevant life. Now, relevant life insurance is effectively a standalone death in service benefit for the director of business, for, or for directors within a business. So the way the relevant life works is it's the company which pays the premiums out of profits. The premiums are then deemed to be an allowable business expense, and then they, therefore they are offset against corporation tax. So effectively, you're paying it directly through the business and you're saving yourself corporation tax at the same time. Now, as an employee as well, or as a director of the business, major benefit is non p 11 dable so it's not a benefit in kind. So it's highly, highly tax efficient from your perspective as contractor to have relevant life insurance through your business to protect you, to protect your family. Point one. Secondly, private medical insurance. So private medical insurance, that's what can enable you to get back to work faster. So if you're ill, you go to your doctor, your doctor will say to you, okay, we need to refer you to a specialist. Doctor refers you to a specialist. You're gonna wait four to six weeks on average to receive an appointment. You might wait another then four to six weeks before you get to see somebody. By well, then you've waited two, three, four months before you've actually even sat down with somebody. Medical insurance, well, you go to your doctor, they give you a referral note, you call your provider, you get authorization, you call the hospital, and you're there, you're sorted, you're done. Within, within a few days, I mean, I, I've, I've used it myself on a few occasions uh, over the past few years, and you know, I've, I've been from GP to consultant in three to four working days. So in terms of returning you to work, it's something to think about because as a contractor you want to get back in as quickly as you can something which is you know say like pretty important for you to take consideration of and income protection insurance finally this is something which i always find really interesting for those that are self-employed because so few people who i come across tend to have income protection insurance and it's amazing how we insure just about everything other than the most important thing which is you as an individual so you insure your house you insure your car you insure your cat probably your dog you insure your mobile phone but who pays for all of that it's you 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 pay for all of that out of your income so if you're not earning any income how are you going to pay for it so income protection insurance if you're sick if you're ill if you're unable to work income protection insurance will replace your income for a period of time normally it's up until retirement but it's incredibly important because you know if you're in an employed role you, you're going to get sick pay for a period of time then i understand it reverts onto statutory and same with self-employed i understand statutory i don't pretend to be an expert on the levels of statutory sick pay um but i know there's something there but it's not going to be adequate to maintain your standard of living let's just put it like that so it's really important from your perspective to start to think about um what you have in place and going back to tom's point Upset where he said to me, you know, when should contractors start to think about these things? Well, you know, these types of plans, this is day one. This is day one. The minute you're out of employment, this is the stuff you need to be thinking about from day one. 
Fine, that's that. So pensions, and also enrolment. So when you work for a business, you will get pensions now because of auto auto enrollment legislation. So auto enrollment legislation dictates that if you are in an employed role, you will have a minimum of eight percent being paid into your pension on an annual basis. Min minimum levels are five percent employee, three percent employer. Now, obviously, if you're self-employed, you're running your own business, you're not going to get that. So it's down to you. The reason why a pension is so important is because ultimately. The amount you build up in a pension, the greater the sum, the greater the potential income you can give yourself when you're no longer working. So it's really important to build up your pension and to focus on retirement planning. And when you're in an employed role, you know, the government have purposely put auto enrollment in place and made it difficult or made it harder, should I say, to opt out than to opt in. In other words, everyone is automatically enrolled. You physically have to go out of your way to say, I don't want to be a part of this pension if you don't want to be. So the government being sensible in that regard and ensuring that as many people as possible are in pensions and as many people as possible are saving towards their futures. Really important. So from your perspective, having a pension in place, A, build up towards your future, B, whatever you build into your pension, pensions from an inheritance tax perspective, and it may not be something you're thinking about now, but it's, it may very well become important to you as time goes on, pensions are outside of your estate for inheritance tax purposes. And then let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Pensions form part of what I call tax efficient profit extraction strategies. They are a highly efficient way to remove profits from your business. And I will explain. So pensions, when you make a pension contribution from your business, it is deemed to be an allowable business expense. So it's a highly efficient way to say towards the future, as the slide says, because it simultaneously reduces your corporation tax liability. So subject to your accountant say so, and subject to it meeting wholly and exclusively rules, the, the value of that contribution, as I say, would be deemed to be an allowable business expense. So let's, let's run with this example. Your company has X amount of capital built up, uh, cash built up in it, of which you deem £30,000 is spare funds. I can do something with just £30,000. So you elect to make a banking contribution. £30,000 goes from your business directly into your pension. You have tax efficiently extracted that money because you now have removed £30,000 and it is sat in your pension building up towards your future. Good job. Secondly, you now have a £30,000 business expense to offset against corporation tax. Therefore, £30,000 at 19% is £5,700. Put that another way, £30,000 employer pension contribution with a £5,700 corporation tax saving means the net cost to you of £24,300. So you've extracted that money in a tax efficient way and you've also saved yourself £5,700 against corporation tax. That is why I deem pensions to be part of a tax efficient profit extraction strategy. Tom, do you have any questions on that? Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you, Mark, I mean, we, we've all wonder how much we need in retirement. Um, <laughs> Particularly when you're looking at pensions, how much do I have to save into a pension? Now, I, I know when we spoke before, you've you've talked me through the kind of rough calculations of, of doing that. Could you could you just do that for the audience? I think it's quite a, an important brings it into perspective. I think. Cool. I'm sorry, I sort of lost you midway through there, but you, you were saying that the the, the, the the essentially the 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 how do you calculate how much you need in retirement? Good. OK, so um, it's a fluid thing, number one, because whatever the value is worth today is not going to be worth the same however many years down the line due to inflation, et cetera, et cetera. However, we can only work with what we have in the here and now. And then we factor other things in as time goes on. And by reviewing, we constantly tweak what we're doing in terms of a plan. However, from day one, what I typically tend to do is I work on a factor of 25 rule. So if, for example, someone were to say to me, I want. £40,000 per year as an income in retirement. Fantastic. 40,000 times by 25 is £1 million. Okay? 40 by 25 is a million pounds. Why do I say that? Well, if you're retired, you don't want to take a huge amount of risk within your pension, within your investment. Therefore, if you are yielding, if your money is growing by 4% per year, which is a sensible growth rate to assume, that million pounds over the course of year one grows by 4%, it's grown by 40,000 pounds. You take 40,000 pounds out as your income. 
Start of year two, a million. Over the course of the year, grows to a million and 40. You take your 40,000 pounds out. That is how you give yourself a sustainable level of income in retirement. In other words, all you're doing is you're drawing down on the growth. The capital is what's providing you the income. But if you had a million, as an example, and it grows to a million and 40, and you take 70,000, you've fallen away from a million. And the following year, the following year, the following year, all you're doing is eating into your capital. So the best way that you can give yourself a sustainable level of income in retirement, especially in the early years, and I appreciate looking at the later years, of course, you can start to eat into the capital, but especially in the early years, it's really important to work on that factor of 25 rule and to, in your head, have that 4% drawdown rate is the rate in which we typically tend to work to. And I've, and I've, I've used that drawdown rate for a number of years. And funnily enough, I was talking to a client back in the last week who we were doing a review. And even though there's been, uh, you know, obviously, a fairly fairly bump in the road this year because we've stuck to four percent religiously over the past few years he's had years where he's built up buffer in his pension and it's balanced out you know year to date how things have been uh, now the, the the drawdown element so his pension is still there at that initial figure as it should be as per our as, as per our plan on day one so it's really important to just stick to that quite religiously and, and is that a million pound that, that, that's actually been put in or is that the effects of compounding and investment and it, how, how does that, how do you get to that million pound pot? Yeah, well, no, good question again. Um, it's, it, it's, it's very simplistic, Tom, in how, how I view this, but it would just be a million pounds worth of investments. It doesn't have to be a million pounds worth of pension. And, you know, the next slide that we're going to come on to is looking at there's more to pensions. And you know, look, I tell you what, I'll, I'll flick onto it now because it's actually you know, pretty pertinent to the point you just made. So there's more to retirement planning, and it's about providing you with an income in the most tax efficient way possible. So you could have, for example, six hundred thousand in your pension. You could have two hundred thousand in an ISA. You could have uh, another uh, hundred thousand in, in a different investment. Another hundred thousand somewhere else. It's just very simply saying this is the capital sum that we need over the longer term in order to generate x level of income so you're completely right in what you're saying if you if you have a pension that's worth a million pounds at retirement you certainly wouldn't have paid a million pounds into it over the years because there would be substantial amounts of growth within that as well but it's just the target figure that we need to realistically achieve in order to provide that sustainable level of income so clearly the earlier you start on that the better is the bottom line the earlier you start the better yes completely and especially you know as with, with contractors um as soon as you're in a position where cash flow allows um pension contributions is something that you should be really thinking about and focusing on and that pensions don't have to be lump big lump sums that go in they don't have to be massive regular contributions you know some of the some of the best ways you can do things are to uh, um you know save on a regular basis and then put our top lump sums into the pension as and when it's right for you to do so yeah so there's more to more to retirement planning than just pensions alone so with that in mind let's say for example working for 40,000 figure pensions just to give a high level um explanation of how they work whenever you draw from pensions 25 percent is tax-free and the rest is taxable. 75% of your pension fund is going to be taxable as if it were earned income, PAYE. So I'm not going to get into the complexities of how we draw down pensions because that's, you know, I could probably spend half an hour talking about that alone. But let's just work on the assumption that whatever you take out of, it, out of a pension is going to potentially be subject to tax. So if you're taking £40,000 a year, less off your personal allowance, you're paying tax on all of it. If, for example, you're at retirement, and you can draw £30,000 a year from your pension and £10,000 a year from an ISA, whatever comes out of an ISA is tax-free. So you're still drawing the top line figure, 40000 but your net figure is going to be greater because you're paying tax on a lesser sum. So it's really about focusing on tax wrappers and how you can diversify your portfolio. Yeah, makes complete sense. Yeah. How we think of time? Just notice 10, 10 35. We're pretty much bang on. We're doing okay. <laughs> we're doing okay. So, yeah, as I say, just when we're thinking about long term retirement planning, and this is why I tend to use the phrase retirement planning more than pension planning, of course, the go to as the go to saving option for retirement is a pension. But then, you know, this is, and this is the importance of financial planning, then we start to think of other ways that we can structure things from a tax efficiency perspective 
And that's when we can start to layer up the portfolio in terms of different tax structures, thinking about things from the long term and how we can minimise what you're going to pay in tax, i.e. pay minimum tax, take home maximum income. So finally, the final slide, um, and I'm have to come in fairly high level on this. So Tom, you, you feel free to fire questions at me, but initially I'm going to come in fairly high level. Tax yeah. advantage investments. The reason why I've got to come in high level, just to explain, because I can see there's obviously quite a few people on the call. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, tax advantage investments, although they can be highly advantageous in terms of how they operate and the tax relief they provide, by definition, according to the Financial Conduct Authority, they are high risk investments. So in saying that, they are not going to be suitable for all investors. Therefore, with that in mind, I can't go into massive amounts of detail when I can't see who I'm speaking to or when different people may have different circumstances. There may be some people on the call where it's appropriate for, some people who it's not appropriate for. So we've got to come in at a fairly high level. If anyone wants me to go into greater detail, then of course I'm happy to do so. I can wax lyrical about these all day long. But we have to have that conversation either in a very, very small group where I can see people or on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So when my details pop up at the back end, please feel free to take them down and then we can have a conversation. So talking about tax advantage investments, the, th the key th three things I focus on are venture capital trusts, enterprise investment schemes, and our inheritance tax service, which utilizes um, business relief, business relief qualifying investments. Venture capital trusts are designed to provide 30% tax relief on whatever you invest. So invest £100, you get £30 back from HMRC. They also designed to provide tax-free dividends. Enterprise investment schemes work in a similar way to venture capital trusts, provide 30% tax relief on whatever you invest. Um, they're also what's known as a business relief qualified. So once you've held them for a period of two years, they're deemed to be outside of the estate for inheritance tax calculations. Um, and you can also defer capital gains into enterprise investment schemes. So they've got, again, a, a separate use for them. And in here, inheritance tax service, well, that's just simply we use business relief qualifying investments, business relief qualifying investments. Um, so they, once held for a period of two years, providing they are held at the date of death, they will be outside of your estate for inheritance tax purposes. So potential uses, tax efficient profit extraction. So when I was talking before about pensions, I typically tend to use pensions alongside VCTs as part of a tax efficient profit extraction strategy. So again, very high level, you can effectively take money out of your business in the form of a dividend, purposely create a, a, a dividend tax liability, roll it into a VCT, and then the tax relief, which is provided to you through the VCT, pretty much offsets the amount of tax you'd have to pay on that dividend. So that's one of the things we can do. You can also do the same thing with the ISs, but I tend to use venture capital trusts more so in that instance. Income tax mitigation, well, venture capital trusts and enterprise investment schemes both tick that box and can be used for that purpose. Um, tax efficient income, tax efficient income, well, you can use, um, you can use the tax relief um, that the VCTs and the EISs kick out in order, in order to actually provide you with a form of tax efficient income. You can, you can build up a series of these investments over the years and start to recycle them. Again, too much detail, I'm not going to go into it now, but there's things you can do, but also more high level on this, the Venture Capital Trust, they are designed to, pro to provide um, a tax-free dividend, and they're normally pretty good at maintaining that. Normally in the region of three to six percent per year, they will pay out in the form of a dividend, and that dividend, well, and with VCTs, is tax-free as well. So that's a, that's a really big advantage for tax-free dividend. Um, inheritance tax planning, I think I've explained that already, um, and also capital gains tax deferrals. If you dispose of, a, of an asset which is liable to tax at capital gains tax rates, you can elect to defer that into an enterprise investment scheme. Um, so again, it's a strategy which isn't right for everybody, it's only right for certain people, but it's something that can be done um, where circumstances dictate that it's going to be the correct thing to do for people. That's tax advantage investments. Tom, do you have any questions in any of these? Uh, I, I mean, uh, clearly, uh, in a tax world, uh, we deal a lot with EISs, VCTs. Probably worth saying there's there's capital gains advantages to them as well from a tax perspective. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think you know, Mark, that that one of my favourite subjects is inheritance tax. Um, how much does that play into your strategy in in creating a, a portfolio that that minimises inheritance tax? Oh, I love inheritance tax work. <laughs> it's really lot. No, I, I do a lot of inheritance tax. Because 
inheritance tax is one of those things where it's so unnecessary to pay. Uh, yeah, it's so unnecessary for for the next generation to pay. And if you planned in the right way, you can you can massively massively minimise the amount of inheritance tax which is going to be due. Um, so where possible, I try to factor it into to, to all plans, if truth be told. And whether that's working out solutions for clients to gift in a tax efficient way, whether it's using trusts and you know people get fixated on trust about thinking oh it's giving away everything into a trust but it's not different trusts and again i could probably spend an hour talking about different type of trust structures but trust planning from my perspective is about removing money from the estate but different trusts are designed to produce different or to allow different degrees of control from outright gifting into other trusts where you retain total control of the initial sum you put into the trust, which, which is the reason why it still sits in your estate, but all the growth on your money is outside the estate from day one. So using trust planning, using gifting, using our inheritance tax service for business relief qualifying investments, it's, it's, it's a pretty big part of what we do. Pensions as well, you know, pensions play a massive part in um, inheritance tax planning. So, you know, wealthy clients who will have um, large estates and you know consider uh, many different assets which they can draw an income from when we get to a point where we're drawing income in retirement their pensions will probably be the last um source that we actually seek to utilize in terms of giving an income because if they've got items if they've got property if they've got uh, investment bonds whatever they might have you know they can draw an income from all these other places and then we simply use the pension just to top it up and the reason why we do that is because Pensions are an intergenerational planning tool. They're outside the estate for inheritance tax purposes. So yeah, I do, I do a lot of inheritance tax planning as well, Tom, and it's something I, I really enjoy. I enjoy it because it's technical, um, and I enjoy it because it makes a big difference to people's lives. That's why I like yeah. it. Well, I, I, I enjoy it as well, and I, I think when I'm speaking to people is, is what, what many don't realise is that actually, you know, where inheritance tax was something that affected the rich before, it, it actually probably will almost affect everyone. I mean, the nil rate band is 325,000. Yeah. No sign of that increasing. That's been the same for, for as long as I can remember. Um, okay, you've got your residency nil rate band, you've got transferable allowances on death, but you know, ultimately, most people's properties is gonna be more than their nil rate band. Um, and therefore, everything else is is gonna be, you know, 40% inheritance tax. As yeah, you yeah. say, it's the easiest to mitigate but it needs forward planning um so you know I, I agree with you i think it has to be something that's factored into to every every sort of investment oh yeah completely and you know also and i, I didn't mention this now so for example even whole of life insurance so whole of life insurance is an insurance policy that you take out and you pay pay it all the way through and then on death it will pay out a lump sum um so you pay it for the whole of your life um but again, if you look at the numbers, whole of life insurance can be, I mean, the numbers are unbelievable in terms of how advantageous it can be to have it. So prime example, and this is, this is an extreme case, for God's sake, so don't, don't think this, this, is, this is the norm. I had a client who we put in place a million pounds of whole of life insurance for him, his guy in his 40s, and we worked out that the premiums would have to be paid for 120 years in order to equal a million pounds. So effectively, right. just another source of investment for him over the longer term, because the premiums are going to be affordable and maintainable for him. So therefore, it makes sense. He pays his premiums forever and a day. He knows when he dies, he has a million pounds worth of cash that will fall into a whole of life trust. Therefore, his kids are going to have a million pounds straight away to use, be it for probate purposes or whatever it may be. So and yeah, that, 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 that policy would be held in a discretionary trust, wouldn't it? And, and therefore fall outside the estate. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, and one of the main advantages of that as well is then, you know, when, when you're going through probate, you can be a nightmare to have assets released. Whereas with a whole of life plan, providing you can, you know, you've got a death certificate and so forth, and you can show the whole of life provider, the insurance provider that the client's dead, they will then pay out funds, and those funds are outside of the estate. So you don't have to wait for probate to be granted. So in, in the case I just mentioned, that client, the, the client's children, before even probates got going, they would have a million pounds to play with in order to help with that process. Yeah, yeah, I think that's quite important. And I'm not, I'm not sure any life policies do get held outside discretionary trust now, but, but certainly um, something it should be thought about. Yeah, agreed. Very much agreed. Um, so we are 
Oh, we're bang on. Look at that. 10.45. Happy days. We're good at this. Uh, look, at, oh, we're good. It's, it's almost like a professional time. We've done this before, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> so something fun to end with i thought um we've had a, a serious chat well i've tried to keep it my heart but a semi-serious chat and i thought this is something fun to him it always makes me laugh it makes my clients laugh when i show this to them um the bottom chart here what we see on the bottom row is the successful investor in other words they they are nonchalant to use that word they they're not bothered the whole way through they understand it's going to be up they understand there's going to be downs can I say it, nonchalant? I never use that word. Where did that come from, Tom? I I I, I was shocked. I... <laughs> I'm sounding really good here. Nonchalant. Um, <laughs> um, they understand it's going to be up. They understand it's going to be down. But ultimately, they're not concerned. They're not concerned. They know they've got that investment objective, and they just ride it out. That's what the successful investor does. Not to say that anyone above isn't successful, but this is why the majority of people need advice. They need someone like can be working with them because 99% of investors experience the above in terms of those emojis. And it explains it in a really neat, quite comical way, how you get really excited and you know, you've got right at the peak of that, that, that first bit on the far left, you've got your dollar signs in your eyes and your tongue out, you think this is great. And then markets fall for whatever reason, because that's, that's what happens. Markets go up, markets go down. They've always done that. They always will do that. That is a fact. Um, you know, as I say to clients, whenever we first start working with each other, there's going to be some great years. There's going to be some good years. There's going to be some average years. There's going to be some bad years. There's going to be some appalling years. I promise you all of that. But if you've got the right time horizon, if we stick to our objectives and we do things the right way, you will get your positive returns over the longer term. And this is what shows it. You know, people on the way down there on this little emoji graph, you can see people getting angry, feeling sick, praying, and then you start to go up again, and then you get that elation, and then it comes down again. So there we go. Something fun to end on. Um, that's no, I, I like that slide. I'm, I'm, I'm stealing that slide. I've already told you that. Yeah, listen, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll settle up, Tom. Um, I'll, I'll send you the image rights to it. No problem at all. We'll, we'll talk about that afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Uh, obviously, your contact details, Mark. Do you want to let everyone know how they can contact you if they do want to have a, a more personal chat? Yeah, of course, please. Um, so if anyone wants to contact me, mobile number's there. Feel free to give me a call. I'm always happy to speak. Um, feel free to shoot me an email as well. Um, email address is there, mark.islin at sjpp.co.uk. Um, feel free to have a look on my website. You can also contact me through the website too. So any of those ways. Um, you know, any questions you have, please just get in touch. There's no such thing as a stupid question, honestly. Um, I, I can almost guarantee that whatever you think is a stupid question, it isn't. And if you're thinking it's a question, someone else thought it's a question, and I've probably been asked it before anyway. So whenever it is, pick up the phone, send me an email. I'm always happy to help, honestly. I mean, WTT and Mark uh, and Islin Wealth work, work very closely together. So if you are a client of WTTs or, or your prospective client at WTTs, we're more than happy to be involved in those conversations with Mark. I think we both believe that it's quite key to have all the important players around the table um, when, when structuring these kind of decisions and because it just allows everyone to give you the best advice and ensure that, that everything's working in your favour. Yeah, completely right, Tom. And, you know, we've, we've said this in days gone by as well. You know, I'm, I'm always happy to have joint meetings with you, with yourself. Um, be it, well, I'd, I'd ordinarily say we can sit around a table, but we can't sit around a table now. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, it's, it's so easy at the moment with Teams, with Zoom. Um, you can set up a call anytime. So, yeah, I, I'm always happy to jump in and just see what I can do to assist people. Brilliant, great stuff. Well, thank you for that, Mark. That that was really, really interesting. I hope everyone's found it useful. Uh, Reese, I'm not sure if I, it's just I can't see the question panel or or we've not got any questions. Um, but... no, no, we haven't got any questions just yet. If anyone has any questions they want to ask Mark, now would be the right time to do so. Um, yeah. Maybe um, a question. Just, just chip in if I can. Yeah. So I can guarantee there's people with questions. Please don't feel that there's there's no such thing as a stupid question just ask it um <laughs> if you're thinking it there's probably someone else is thinking it too so do feel free just to ask if you have any questions i mean reese what about you have you got any questions from from that conversation um honestly i, I don't think so i mean the 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 key takeaway from me and and thank you mark it was a very very useful conversation especially in the context of contracting and and how to plan i thought the the kind of indication around Kind of more 
I guess, less obvious um, provisions like life insurance and things like that, which you don't consider really to be investment or, or planning in their nature, um, but which are so in, in, imperative in terms of future planning and future protection of your family. I think that's a really useful point. And clearly the tax benefits associated with those where you run a uh, personal service company are there. Um, and so I think for, for me, that was that was a big kind of indication that actually there's there's much more to investment planning than just looking at investments. Um, so that was a really, really useful, useful point from me. We do have one question, um, which is how does IR35 need to be considered in the planning? Um, and I think, I mean, that's a that's an interesting point really. And an IR35 is obviously going to be a <laughs> Is, is going to be a problem where the reforms come in April 2021 and we've got a presentation on this in, in an hour or so and what that will do is that will kick the, um, the the requirement for making the determination onto the end client so actually what will happen is that contractors will have less say in whether a contract is inside or outside but it's very likely that a contract will be determined inside or outside um, in advance of it being taken because the end client will plan for the contract to be inside or outside at that stage. So really your consideration is coming back to Mark's earlier slide over the differences between employed and self-employed benefits is if the contract is outside IR35, then clearly you'll remain or it's anticipated you'll remain using your personal service company and you can use those kind of benefits through that. If you're looking at taking an inside IR35 contract, then it may well be sensible to consider taking a full-time employment role to get those benefits, to get those life insurance, medical insurance benefits from an employed perspective rather than a deemed employment perspective of inside IR35. So I think there does need to be some um, planning around the IR35 depending on what type of contract you're taking but again that's going to be a short-term plan because the contract may be six months 12 months maybe three months and so really we should be thinking long-term planning here as Mark says um, over a number of years um, sorry to jump in there Mark I just conscious that okay. IR35 is a little bit more specific to tax so yeah, thought yeah, I'd... No, no. I'm glad you did to be honest because <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm 35 is more more your area than it is mine. Yeah. So certainly, no, no, I, I don't think I've got a huge amount. I can sort of chick in on that. You, you, you're right. What you're saying. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, yeah. What about family income benefits? Can you talk yeah. around family income benefit? Yeah, family income benefits. They're, they're I think they're great and they're really underused. Um, family income benefits. Whereas a, um, uh, a life policy pays out a lump sum on death, a family income benefit will pay out an income. So, for example, it may well be that life cover is designed to pay out £200,000 on death, as an example, whereas a family income benefit may be designed that it pays out to the surviving uh, beneficiary £2,000 a month uh, for a period of however many years. So, family income benefits are something which are underused. They should be, they should be as part of a belt and braces protection solution. They should be used more often. The reason I say that is because let's say you have life cover in place and you die, your spouse gets paid out the cover and they clear their mortgage. Fantastic. How do they now maintain standards of living? How do they maintain standards of living? They may, they may still be working, but they may have to reduce hours. They may have been stay at home with kids or whatever. There's various reasons. So if you're at that point, you may have a family income benefit too, then you can then also generate an income and maintain standards of living. So family income benefits, um, I don't think they're used enough. Um, I, I use them where it's applicable to do so. Um, and I think, as I say, as part of a belt and braces planning solution, definitely worthwhile. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and the final question, um, and with the remaining five minutes, perhaps, you could go into tax, tax efficient profit extraction a little bit more detail. I know we spoke around pensions, um, and obviously contractors know well about uh, extraction through other methods, dividends and things. Um, but are there any other kind of tax efficient profit extractions methods 
that you think are kind of sensible in terms of planning for a contractor? Uh, from, a, from, a, from a wealth management perspective, I mean, look, I think, I think going back to Tom's point about getting all your correct people around the table, there's lots of different ways or lots of different expertise that can chip in to help with tax efficient profit extraction. You know, yourselves, obviously accountants and um, myself, there's, there's lots of different areas of crossover. Um, so, you know, like accounting as an example, they're gonna make the, um, they're gonna provide advice on dividend splits, dividend versus salary splits and how you can extract money, what you can offset, what you can't offset. From, from my perspective in terms of um, wealth management financial planning, um, I typically tend to view tax efficient profit extraction as pensions, VCTs, EISs, and then um, you know using things like relevant life in order to mitigate uh, or, to, or to bring down corporation tax liabilities in that regard. So they're, they're the key things that I tend to use if I'm to be entirely honest. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, one final question before we depart then. Uh, we touched on it earlier around using trusts. And yeah. it's invariably the case that the, the word trust is a bit of a dirty word in the contracting world for obvious reasons. I yeah. think there are there are invariably very um, straightforward and very compliant ways of using trusts. Yeah. Um, could you perhaps talk a little bit more around the kind of trust work you do in a general perspective and um, how that might be used? Yeah, sure. So um, trust, trusts are used... I know, I know we've had conversations about this in days gone by about how trusts have been used in, you know, from, from, a, from a contracting perspective. And it's, it's completely different. You have to almost just remove that from your mind. Yeah, I know it has the same word, trust, but it's, it's, it, it's very different. And, and sorry to draw a silly analogy. I've just, <laughs> just remembered, I was in the garden with my two-year-old yesterday and pulled to bark off a tree. And I said, yes, bark off a tree like bark when a dog barks. Same word, very, very different. Um, so... When we use trusts, it's principally to plan for inheritance tax purposes. And it's about keeping whatever assets are in that trust outside of the estates. So that they're not gonna be liable to inheritance tax at 40%. Trusts are also there for control. So trusts ensure that the right people get past the right assets at the right time. So for example, if you set up a trust fund for a child, um, you can, as a trustee of that trust, you can make sure that the child is responsible enough to receive those assets at a certain point in the future. Whereas, for example, junior ISAs, which are fantastic from a tax efficiency perspective, but child has an automatic right to that when they turn 18 years old. So if they suddenly build up a massive fund and then they want to wander off to uni and spend it all boozing and having a great time, they can do that. But if you've got the assets in a trust and you set up a trust fund, then you've got additional control over that. So main uses of trust in my world is control and it's for inheritance tax, whether it's protection plans being paid into trust, whether it's investments that we're setting up in trust. That's that's the sole purpose of them. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I think that's a very different um, kind of perspective than how trusts have been used in the past. So um, that's good to hear. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, we don't have any other questions. So. <laughs> Remains to be said is thank you ever so much, Mark. That was a fantastic presentation, really informative, sure. really useful. Um, for those who are listening and want to listen back, there will be a recording of this available. Um, and similarly, you have all of Mark's contact details there to direct, to contact him directly um, and chat through in more detail. I'm right in thinking you offer free consultation, Mark, um, to oh, chat with you. Any so, time. Really so, pay me is to become a client. So yeah, of course, it's always obligation free. Brilliant. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for joining and um, hopefully we'll see you on some, some of the further seminars throughout the day. Thank you again, Mark, and we'll speak again soon. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye, Tom.